Hello, believers, and welcome to Azteca Underground. I am Durger Time, and this is a brand new series that you probably have seen uh, the trailer for and probably the behind the scenes stuff for. Uh, so I won't go too far into what we are looking at here, um, but I do want to give a little bit of a synopsis before we get into it about what to expect with the show. So Azteca Underground is a heavily story based playthrough through TEW 2020, uh, a bizarre what-if scenario of what if the the sort of storyline that was ruminating through MLW became a revival of Lucha Underground. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of storylines going on, going to be um, very narrative-focused, so we're probably not going to do too much in terms of the behind-the-scenes uh, like we would in the NWA, where we're dealing with, you know, who's this, who's that, who's gimmick, and uh, the, the the sort of back-end stuff. It's really going to be more about telling the story and using the game as a medium to tell that story. Um, now, the question is, is what really is Azteca Underground? Uh, it is using... A lot of, but not exclusively, members of Lucha Underground. Uh, so, you know, Eva uh Conan, you know, Little Cholo, uh, Mil Mortes, Pentagon Jr., Sexy Star. Very familiar faces. It's run by Dario Cueto. In reality, it would be run by somebody else. But for the sake of simplicity, we're actually using him as the owner. It really doesn't matter. Um, the real owners of this company, if it existed, would be some amalgamation of somebody that a, a AAA and MLW agreed to hire or something. But Derry Cueto, it's a new company, um, and it is definitely sort of following the 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 lineage of of uh, Lucha Underground. Now, is this a reboot? Yes. Is this a retelling or reimagining? Yes. Is this a sequel? Yes. Uh, it is all three of those in a very weird way, and you guys will see as things unfold. So, there are going to be wrestlers that you're familiar with in this story that play new roles that they didn't have in the previous in the previous iteration of Lucha Underground. They're they're almost like uh they've been recasted into new roles. There are some people that are returning in very similar roles. There are some characters that maybe are returning as those exact same characters. Um it the best way to look at it, at least at the starting point right now, is imagine if Lucha Underground was almost like an urban legend that someone told. And so some of it may have happened. Some of it may not have happened. Uh, you don't really know. And as we progress through the show, you'll find out more of sort of how that's working. Now, if you've never watched Lucha Underground before, um, obviously this game, we're probably the story will give us a, a basic understanding of what's going on. But understand, Lucha Underground was a very fantastical um, wrestling show. The uh, characters, uh, real wrestlers were portraying characters, sometimes with their own name, um, and like real name attached to it, but as a different character. Um, other people were had completely renamed characters. Uh, some people were playing themselves, but as a more fantastical version of that. Uh, there was magic. Uh, mysticism, ancient gods, time travel, demons, people would die. So it, it's a very um, grandiose show, and we're going to keep that alive. You're never going to know what's going to happen in these shows that we're doing. Now, uh, for a little bit of behind-the-scenes stuff, we have a million dollars in the bank. Some of that was already eaten away to bring out and unretire the Lucha Underground titles and rebrand them. Um, so they do have their correct lineage, which I probably didn't really need to do, because story-wise, they really wouldn't, and we'll kind of get into that. The, uh, other thing is for broadcasting, we are doing a TV show on Tough TV, um, which is hilarious. We have a one-year expiration, we have a minimum quality of 
34, which I, I hope we hit. We should. Um, and 35 for Azteca. So uh, we're still going to have to put on the best show possible. It's still going to be that element of it. Um, we probably will not do pay-per-views. This is really going to be more of a television show. There may be one pay-per-view, and it will be like a season finale. Um, and, and we'll probably break this show up into seasons. There might be like so many episodes, and then a season, and then we'll do a break in real life, but come back to it for a season two or something like that. Um, because that, that is how uh, this is, was run. It was run like a TV show, and we're going to kind of try to keep that up here. Um, so, story-wise, Lucha Underground was about an underground fighting rink run by a mysterious man named Dario Cueto, who uh, progressively seemed that he had uh, tapped into some darker forces from uh, ancient Mexican lore, and uh, there was an element of mysticism that's going on. But it, so it, it basically, it, it's not dissimilar to like a Mortal Kombat of uh, it, it. At its face, it looks like just a fighting organization, an underground fighting league. But there's actually something a little bit darker going on. And I don't want to spoil anything. So if you haven't watched it, it's available on Tubi TV. I highly recommend just watching it. I think it's absolutely the best wrestling show ever made. I think it, it is absolutely what could have been the next step forward for professional wrestling if it had given more time, more eyes on it. I think it was a a, a huge step in the right direction in terms of evolving the uh, the the sort of genre, if you will. Anyways, that's all I got for that. Um, we got a big roster. Um, well, big for what we are. There will be more people added, um, but. Uh, some of these are their real names, some of them are not. So we got A.J. Hammerstone, played by Alexander Hammerstone. Uh, he is, in our story, going to be a uh, movie star. So let's expect that. Big Rick, played by Ezekiel Jackson. Blue Demon Jr., Carlito. Uh, Katrina, coming back from Lucha Underground. Chavo Guerrero Jr. is mostly actually our road agent, but will probably play a role in some storylines. Chris Bay. Uh, Derek Cueto, Bestia666 playing Demonio Jr., or Demonio Jr., uh, Drago, Dragon Lee, El Tejano returning, Famous B, uh, Lou Fisto playing uh, Genevieve LaRue, is a new character, Rosemary playing Holly Leckman, Ivelisse, uh, Jacob Fott 2 from MLW uh, showing up, Killshot. <laughs> Casey Navarro playing Killshot Nero. There was a character uh, called Killshot in Lucha Underground, and I'm kind of giving him his the lineage in a bit. Conan, uh, Laredo Kid, uh, Little Cholo, Leo Rush, uh, No More Taste, which is a returning character who's also an MLW now, and sort of the spawn of this whole thing because uh, they're doing a storyline called Azteca Underground there. Nick Gage. Who I who won't show up right away, by the way. I need a good name for Nick Gage. His character is basically a psychopath, so pretty real to life. If you guys got a good idea for a name, let me know. Uh, Pentagon Jr. returning. Ricky Ray is returning. Rush, just being himself, sort of. Sexy Star returning. Shaw Guerrero. Uh, Sean Hernandez, Son of Havoc, a.k.a. Matt Cross. Superfly. Paul London playing a new character called The Collector. The Mac. Uh, played by William Mack. Uh, Marty the Moth and Martinez playing a sort of new character called the Voice of the Old Gods. Thunder Rosa, and obviously Vampiro, and then uh, Th uh, Thea Trinidad playing a character just named Vega. Um, so, small roster going to be growing. We're hiring a few more people. If there's people that you think would be interesting, let me know, uh, both in the comments, but also um, join our Discord. There's a link in the description. There's actually a channel that I'm checking regularly and I'm responding to regularly in there called the Azteca Underground Writers Room. So join that. Um, I weigh consideration heavily in that um, in that room, and a lot of storylines, characters, whatever will be springboarded in there. 
Um, so it'll be your opportunity if you want to make some changes or make some ideas, go into that um, that channel in our Discord, and you'll be able to kind of you know, kind of chat with other people that are watching and uh, maybe come up with something that will be added to the series. All right, let us get on over to the show. Take a look at what our debut episode of Azteca Underground will be. All right, we're ready for our show. We do have some backstage incidents. Take a look at it real quick. Because um, obviously we still are going to have things happening uh, backstage we're going to have to deal with. There's still going to be contracts and other things that we're going to have to manage, and that's going to be a problem. But uh, we will deal with it as we go. I'm not liking the fact that I see Sexy Star already with an issue. Uh, she got a lot of heat with the locker room for pulling off Tasteless Rib on everyone backstage. Um, I'll give her a stern warning. Uh, we got something with Ivelisse and Conan. Was brought before a wrestler's uh, court and accused of being an hour late and basically told that she has to, you know, pay for everyone's beers. Uh, same thing for Tejano, um, for who did not pick up his share of a, a rental car tab. So Conan holding wrestler's court, doing well here. Um, I will medal just randomly here. Why not? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, cool. So we got a show. Um, the issue with booking this is that everyone is working everywhere. So I may end up at some point setting it to do uh, uh, multiple shows at a time, which I've never done before. Um, I don't know how that will look in terms of editing or, or how... Uh, how it's portrayed, so I will have to play around with that, but right now we're just doing one show at a time, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right, so we have one hour for our first Azteca Underground, a whole bunch of storylines uh, in the very beginning here that we are uh, hoping to kind of lead us into the first quarter of the show, or first quarter of the series, I think, for season one. Um, and then things will develop as they go. So let's see if we can book uh, a pretty tame Azteca Underground. See if we can uh, lead people into the story a bit. All right. All right, guys, we are ready for our show. We've got a full 65 minutes, a lot of story to go through, um, but we're keeping it pretty simple. So, um, you know, don't expect something too crazy yet, but not far off. So we're going to start a very simple Azteca Underground to start our show. And let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's start our very first episode. So we start with a camera shot. It's low to the ground, very shot, very much like a, a television show. It's on a damp and dark, broken pavement outside of a dilapidated building at night. You can see two legs come into frame as they stop their walk in front of the old factory entrance. The camera pans upwards to the back of the figure, a man in a dark and well-pressed suit. In his hand, a shimmer of something being grasped. It's something metallic, perhaps gold, maybe silver, maybe brass. It's hard to tell. A hint of a glimmering green light escapes through the cracks of his fingers that hold the object tightly. It seems almost otherworldly. He pockets the trinket as the camera lifts further up to reveal the back of a head and a mural on the wall. It is a graffiti mural with a stylized luchador fighting on it, and in the middle of it, words emblazoned, Azteca Underground, in the center of the piece. The figure turns towards the camera, looking beyond to the alley behind him. It's Dario Cueto, the Spanish proprietor 
of Azteca Underground. He stares toward the, cram the camera and, almost like breaking the fourth wall, cracks a sinister-looking grin. Uh, does well, 45. Inside the temple, uh, it's well lit, and definitely is at a gate. Old factory floor, converted into a makeshift arena. A few hundred fans sit on bleacher-style seating around a dirty-looking wrestling ring. Shades of brown and dark red uh, dot the mat, and an unknown mixture of maybe dirt and possibly blood have been uh, saturated through this mat over God knows how long, washed away but stained after constant repeated use. The place does not appear to care for hygiene. On the commentary team, we have Vampiro and Matt Stryker. They welcome the viewers, who they call believers, into the temple uh, and announce the first exhibition match for the night, a good and roaring luchador fight. And the ring announcer introduces our competitors. Inside we have Laredo Kid versus the Son of Havoc. Uh, both have a strong exhibition match to uh, work the crowd. Unfortunately, Laredo Kid gets a awful gimmick for his just general luchador um, gimmick here. Laredo had a 35, and the Son of Havoc had a 45. And in it, Laredo Kid actually defeats Son of Havoc in 10 minutes uh, by a submission. Gets us a 43, which is not too shabby. After the fact, Laredo Kid's celebrating in the ring. Uh, Son of Havoc kind of slinks away and refuses a handshake. Uh, meanwhile, Conan, a veteran and a talent scout, is standing uh, basically near the, the steps of the arena. They don't have an entranceway. There's like uh, like tiered pyramid-like steps leading from the top that they all enter from. Um, and he's observing Laredo Kid, seemingly taking an interest in him. Um, Loretta Kid doesn't really in encounter him or, or confront him or anything. Kind of just goes to the back, but we just see uh, Conan definitely observing him. Um, unfortunately, I had Conan set to be entertaining, and I forgot to set him to scripted, so he tried to improvise something. I don't know what, but that did very poorly. After that, we have uh, in the office, Daria Cueto. Uh, having watched the results of their initial match uh, unfold between a set of dirty Venetian blinds from the breakout office box. Uh, this location was at one point some type of, some type of foreman's office. It's like filled with what would have been filled with cabinets and bundles of paperwork and TPS reports and maps of the factory floor. It's now replaced by a gaudy wooden desk littered with trinkets. Various captured exploits from Dario's adventures over the years. Someone knocks on the door. Come in, Dario says, before meeting the gaze of the individual that walks in. And in walks in Chris Bay, a bright-eyed young talent looking ready to go and unfazed by the weird conditions that he's in. I've got your invitation, he said, dropping the pamphlet down on the desk. Dario smiles and says, Ah, good, welcome, my boy. You're about to embark on a journey unlike anything you've ever experienced. This is the real deal. You have the talent. Let's see what you can do. Impress me tonight, and I will offer you with a unique opportunity. Bay's gut churns, and we can see it. There's something wrong about this place, and he just can't quite put his finger on it. Something wrong about this man, even. But the offer sounds good. Money's money, and a fight's a fight. He nods in agreement. Back to the ring, we have a triple threat match between three female competitors. Now, in Lucha, uh, Lucha Underground, and as well as Azteca Underground, it's an intergendered match, because there are really very little rules. So. Um, the women fighting do not have to exclusively fight women. They fight pretty much everybody. Um, in this case, though, we do happen to have all three female competitors here uh, working against each other, but that's not always going to be the case or really the, the standard. 
In this match, we have Holly Leckman, Thunder Rosa, and Ivelisse. It actually had great heat and pretty decent wrestling. Thunder Rosa defeated Holly Leckman and Ivelisse uh, in seven minutes. Thunder Rosa pinned Holly Leckman uh, after a Love Rosa. Holly had a 37. Thunder Rosa had a 42. Ivelisse had a 43. We had, unfortunately, a uh, awful rating for Holly and adequate for Thunder Rosa. Um, and obviously our color commentary is doing good, and the crowd got hotter from this, which is nice. After that, though, we have Holly after the match on the ground in the corner. She's hurt and bruised after the match. Uh, she just doesn't look like she belongs in the temple. She almost has a, a suburban mom look over a hardened fighter. There was no doubt during the match that she has the technical skills, but she just simply seemed like she was almost holding back in the ring. That ruthlessness that you would expect was not there, and it cost her. Thunder Rosa, though, walks over and offers her hand up and hand to get up. Holly smiles and kind of takes it as a sign of camaraderie or friendship and uses, takes the hand and uses the leverage to pull herself upwards to uh, stand up and face Thunder Rosa. Thunder, though, doesn't let go. Rosa's holding on deep to the grip of the hand, pulls her in a little bit closer, and with her free hand, just goes and smacks her right into the gut. A cheap sucker punch for fun. Holly slumps back from the force of the punch um, and falls back into the corner while Thunder Rosa walks away laughing. She disembarks from the ring, climbs down from the ropes, and actually goes right to the announce table, grabbing Matt uh, Stryker's headset off of him uh, to talk into the microphone. And she says, Housewives need to stay home. This place is for real women, real fighters. Someone take her away before she gets herself killed. Um, so Thunder, huge ego, calling out Holly. Um, and um, maybe for her own self-good, possibly. Uh, the segment does fine. It's a 33. Thunder Rose is getting better at her gimmick. We have a quick squash match between Blue Damon Jr. and a local talent, Steve Payne. Um, Blue Damon defeats him in one minute by submission with a sharpshooter. Um, the crowd not very impressed from Blue Damon Jr. Uh, and he gets a 34, though. Steve Payne gets a 26. We just give a quick match to a, a legend here. Uh, who also showed up in the very first episode of Lucha Underground. So it's just almost like a poetic rhythm here that we're kind of not necessarily replaying the steps of it, but we have some similar beats happening. Unfortunately, the match is not great. Um, it gets a 29. This segment does better. Uh, after that match, though, we have backstage in a dirty locker room. We see AJ Hammerstone, slick back, spiked hair, sunglasses and a suit uh, straight out of Hollywood. Uh, this individual is getting eyed by various competitors preparing for uh, work in the locker room. AJ, though, is ignoring them on his cell phone, talking to a manager as he moves his feet delic delicately around to avoid trash and old piles of stained clothing. There's no, no, no. No, I I'm not having second thoughts. AJ banters on his cell phone. I just, I don't, I don't know. I, I didn't expect it to be like this. Hammerstone is a familiar face to the members of the locker room. A movie star, a celebrity of sorts. You can kind of see it in the eyes around him. Um, though he definitely looks out of place. No, Jacob says to his manager on the phone, interrupting him from, we don't hear the other side of the conversation. He's like, no, I'm, I'm doing this. Listen, I'm going to be in the starring role of uncontrolled demolition too. I need to look like a badass fighter. This will be good for my character work. I've done some MMA in college. How hard could a place like this be? I mean, half of them are wearing masks. <laughs> they don't even look like they're taking this seriously. Oh, hey, hey Jacob, I got to go. I'm up next. Uh, he gets a very good rating for his movie star gimmick and a pretty strong segment for the size that we are in. Uh, and Hammerstone is the competitor to Chris 
in his unique opportunity match. So it's Chris Bay versus AJ Hammerstone. Um, and a cocky AJ Hammerstone actually defeats Chris Bay in 12 minutes um, after using the ropes for leverage um, and cheating his way to win. So Chris Bay fails his unique opportunity. Um, instead, it looks like Hammerstone might be uh, getting that. And Hammerstone has a 39. Chris Bay has a 40. Is this my good side? Started to advance with the segment. And we get a 42 for the match itself. Got the crowd buzzing, in fact. After the fact, Dario comes out of his office um, and say to Chris Bay that I am utterly disappointed in you, but there's potential here. And tells Hammerstone that he's in line for a unique opportunity next week and continue to impress him and great things will happen. Uh, we advance two separate storylines in this situation. Uh, Hammerstone working the crowd well, doing very well in just sort of his mannerisms and capturing uh, the audience, and we get a 40 for the segment. And Hammerstone will now have some type of unique opportunity, maybe a match, maybe a challenge for a belt. We still have the belt vacated, um, so there's still an opportunity there. Meanwhile, we, we cut to the back as Dario walks back away. And he's walking through um, a dark area of the locker room, having, after just um, talked to Hammerstone. He walks through a dim part of that locker room. It's completely empty. Thick, black shadows all around. As he passes a row of lockers bathed in that kind of veil of darkness, a woman appears seemingly impossibly from the shadows. She's tall with dark hair, clad in a leathery, leathery black dress, and her eyes have a mixed expression as, as though they're pools of both seduction and haunted natures at the same time. I don't know why I wrote Catalina in this. Um, Dario felt the presence and speaks to her without even turning, seemingly unfazed by her impossible reappearance. What do you want, Katrina? He seems to know her. I'm very intrigued by you, that's all, she says. This all feels so familiar, yet new. Do you think they feel it too? She says mysteriously. I don't know what you mean, Dario says, seemingly unconvincingly. Really, she teases and gets up close to him as she talks. And what is it that you are gripping so tightly in your pocket, Dario? He takes his hand out of his pocket, not realizing he even was gripping something at the time. What do you want? He ignores the question that she asked. I want him back, she says ominously. Dario breaks the feigned... Um, the, the feigned confusion that he has in this situation. Gets right to the point to her. He says, you know, it's not that easy. But there's a cost. But I think it is something we can arrange. He kind of smiles at her. Um, unfortunately, I think I had this set wrong. Dario should have been set for something else. And uh, Katrina kind of failed in the situation, so I gotta remember uh, find the right attribute for her to uh, uh, protect her a little bit because this, this this segment should have done a little bit better. Um, but an interesting story beat. Katrina's mentioning something as though she knows him somewhere. So the question and the question really is where does he where does do they know each other? And also, what is she referencing when she says that? Do you think they know, or do they think they feel it too? It's kind of a weird phrasing. We don't really know who they are and, and what she's referencing. We also don't know who this person she wants back is. Um, some of you may. Some of you may have an idea. But she clearly wants something from Dario and thinks Dario can do something. And we really don't know what, what he, she's referencing at this point. And to finish the show, we start where 
we began, or we end where we began, I should say, we see the same shot of the dilapidated walls from the intro of the show, the same wet pavement cracked and splintered from disuse, bits of trash dancing on top of it, uh, right on top of the asphalt as a little light gust of wind blows through the alleyway. In our frame, a pamphlet for Azteca Underground lays onto the asphalt from the movement of the wind. You can read on it, at least the front of it, saying, Are you looking for the ultimate challenge? Make your ancestors proud. Be more than you could possibly imagine. The pamphlet starts to lift again from the wind as another gust forms, but before it can take off, in its flight, a big boot steps on it and traps it in place. A hand slowly reaches down in frame to pick it up and examine it. It's a large hand with dark skin. The camera pans up to the back of the figure, dressed as though that they're ready for war. We don't see their face, they never turn, and we never get a good look at what they look like. Only a silhouette that kind of gives appearance to a bald round head and a brief spark of light from the front from a lighter to an unseen cigar All right, second does okay 41 and that ends our first episode of azteca underground a 35 we need to play into our stories a little bit more we also need to uh, fix our production quality, which we will do in between episodes. But an interesting appearance and an interesting first show. We have some storylines built up and some mysteries being built here. Um, so hopefully you guys like it. I'm curious to see what you guys are talking about in the Discord. So please join the Discord from the description and start talking about it today. I'd like to hear some of your ideas, some of your thoughts, some of your theories. Um, the, <laughs> the ones that are really good, I might take and steal for the show. Um, we do, I do have a rough outline of what's going to happen in the show, so um, I kind of know where things are going for Season 1, but there's a lot of smaller things that are going to happen, and there's a lot of storylines that we haven't involved yet, um, because obviously there's only a limited amount of time, so expect some more characters some more stories to pop up um but yeah so that was the first episode uh fairly good um pretty happy with what we had so thank you guys for joining me for the first episode here and i'll see you guys next time